Good afternoon, everybody. Today we're going to do a session on B2B product. We have a panel. Jason Lemkin is uh, going to moderate. Thank you very much. We have Solomon from Docker, Tracy from PlanGrid, and Harry from Lob. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. So this is a great session. Uh, everyone's seen all the prior sessions online, right? Raise your hand if you haven't. All right, good, 100%. They're great. Um, so I, I watched Aaron Levy, and we had Deska Moskovitz, and Stuart Butterfield, and others. And uh, what I thought would be particularly fun, since we have three amazing uh, founders here of B2B companies, is to particularly hone in on the intersection of building great products and revenue. Uh, because we all want to be product visionaries. Uh, I, I, I certainly did myself. Uh, but if you can't sell it, and it's a B2B product, ultimately, what, what's the point of all of it? Um, so I want to dig into a couple stories, both in the early days and a little bit later, to help folks like you, who probably are, ju are just have inklings of how to potentially monetize your dreams, because the stories are always uh, different than we think. So let me give uh, 10 seconds on each of the panelists, and let me have them dig in a little bit more on their companies. Um, but Solomon from Docker, uh, I don't know who here knows about Docker, but I'm guessing most of the 300,000 folks online that'll, that'll read it. But uh, Docker, he'll give you some more context, founded in 2010, but not as Docker as, what was it called back then? Dot cloud. Dot cloud, which we'll get to a story. Raised almost 200 million, um, and Docker is sort of a foundational piece of infrastructure that everyone builds software on today. So we'll, we'll get into that, um, but it is seven years into this journey, right? Into a, likely a 70-year journey or 14-year journey. Um, Tracy probably in PlanGrid is probably in the middle of, a, of this rock star group. Uh, PlanGrid was founded a little bit later, 2011? 2011. Got it. Uh, raised 60 million? Something like that. Right. So money isn't everything, but it, it does help. Um, and PlanGrid, you'll learn, is super cool, automates construction management, um, and kind of has shaken up uh, a shockingly large industry, a shockingly large part of, of, of software, and you'll learn a little bit more about those stories, and I want to learn more. And then Harry uh, runs Lob, um, and uh, which turns mail into an API, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Raised 10 million, um, so he's got an, another 190 million to, to catch up, uh, and 50 million. But off to a very strong start. Founded in 2013. Yes. So you're 30. What's that? Yeah. yeah. All right. So you've uh, and you're four years in, right? So it's just when it's getting both good and hard, yeah. right? At the same time, I would imagine, right? So I want to dig in, but uh, those are the intros, but um, give me a little bit more intro on, on the company, like number of employees and uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the latest challenge you have today or any other quick, quick tidbits on the company. Sure. So uh, currently it's 350 employees at Docker. Um, we actually started in 2008. 2008. Yeah, we were oh. bootstrapped in France and then it wasn't working, so we moved here, got into YC, and that really, really, really helped. Um, so anyway, got it. Nine years. Nine years. <laughs> um, Did you sort of refound the company in YC? We you, count those yeah. or, you don't count those early years. Or you it, it depends who you ask, but yeah, we, <laughs> it, it counts. The same company, same problem we were trying to solve. Uh, so, 350 employees, lots of growth, yeah. lots of excitement. Um, the biggest challenge for us, I mean, the biggest challenge last year was proving that we could build a, a business, a viable, high-growth business, on top of this excitement for stuff that is, in large part, free and open source. Right, um, and that was last year. We we proved that model, and this year the challenge is to scale it, and to scale it faster than our competitors, who now figured out that the model is proven. So it's a big uh, competitive battle, and a really uh, lucrative space. So that's yeah. the challenge this year. Good. Hi everyone. My name is Tracy Young. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of PlanGrid. PlanGrid builds, as you said, beautiful, simple, effective software for the construction industry. Um, we emerged from Y Combinator's winter 2012 batch, and since then we've grown from five co-founders to 310 people, um, which is not something to brag about. It means our payroll is very high. Um, <laughs> but we've helped build over 500,000 construction projects from the smallest kitchen remodels to the largest projects in the world. and. Um, we are available on all of the platforms. Apple actually named us one of the top 10 enterprise apps of 2016, which is pretty awesome. Um, now we're also the largest digital blueprint repository in the world. We have over 50 million sheets of blueprints in our cloud and growing. Thanks. Uh, so I'm sitting here with, we got 40 employees, hoping I wish I had 150. Uh, <laughs> but a little bit about Lob, uh, I'm one of the founders. Uh, my name is Harry Zhang. Um, 
started a company in 2013, and what we do is uh, build tools to make it easy for developers to control the offline world. So we actually deal with a physical component, uh, an industry that many of you think may be dying, but in fact is very much the opposite, uh, dealing with letters, postcards, and other types of mail, and really building a, a layer of technology on top of that to make it easy for companies to do that. So hopefully many of you have received a piece of mail from Lob, uh, especially in this area, in the Bay Area, uh, and we service companies, you know, we're trying to make this switch into selling to, you know, mid-market and other startups into selling into the Forge 500. So a lot of our challenges today is really how do we move into enterprise and take what used to be, you know, a one single tool and translate it into a larger full solution for larger companies. Good. So hang on to the microphone because there's just one other question I want to ask the whole panel. But I, like, I, I really like to talk about the concept of, uh, of a minimum sellable product not a, a viable product, like what it actually takes to, to make real money. Um, so Harry, tell me what, what happened with Lob. Do not count other companies from your batch uh, or customers you got off Hacker News. What, how did you get that first, those first unaffiliated customers and what made the product sellable? Sure. Yeah, I think one of the common things that's easy to get in the habit of thinking that customers are going to come to you because you have a great product and a great solution. Um, we, that works maybe in the beginning for smaller companies, but as you go after your first real customer, uh, our first real customer was, was Oscar Insurance uh, over in New York. So the, thing, the way we got to them was cold email, and we sent thousands and thousands of emails. I personally wrote like every single one and got a response from the CEO. And I think one of the, the key things is to really have an understanding of why your company is going to talk to you. Uh, what is the problem that you're solving for them? As opposed to like, here's what my product does and these are the features that I have. Right? You want to be very pinpoint about what that message is. Um, people are actually surprisingly open to respond to your email as long as it's relevant. Um, so for us, uh, we happened to hit on the problem for Oscar, which is they had a mail vendor uh, and they knew there was this regulation called HIPAA which essentially how you uh, govern and control uh, private health information. And what we realized uh, was that this was our opportunity. And they were looking at new vendors. Uh, they did not trust that their existing vendor had HIPAA and was secure. Uh, and we could point to a small customer we had already done it for in the past. Uh, and that's how, how we got into the conversation. It took us about you know, two, three months to get the deal done. But really, what you need is to identify a core problem that larger companies haven't quite figured out. And even if your solution isn't the best you know, that's out there. It needs to be to a point where the customer's willing to buy. So we start off with one use case, very, very simple explanation of benefits. Today we send, you know, probably 50 different types of mail, checks, postcards, practically everything. But the key is to pick one small use case that you, they need to have a real problem around and that you're gonna go solve. So that's what we did with Oscar. And you know, it's, it's funny to this day, they're still one of our larger customers. And uh, it all just came from like a three sentence email to their CEO. Do you remember what the headline of the email was? Um, it was like, uh, we can help you with your mail. We can help you with your mail. That yeah. worked, huh? It, it did work. <laughs> uh, it's, we've now learned a lot that that's probably what I do today. Yeah. Um, but at the time, uh, we knew that you know, healthcare sent a lot of mail. And uh, we, also, we also did the You've Got Mail, which got a pretty good chuckle um, yeah. from folks in a day. But really, the, the core of the content was in the first two lines, which was like, we know companies have problems sending secure, audible mail. Yeah. Right? We built a technology solution around doing this. Do you have 15 minutes to talk about it? Right? That's pretty much what the, the core content was. But the key is to get straight to the point. What are you going to solve? What's the problem? And you know, asking for a little bit more time. I never talked to CEO, but he punted me down the chain, but got the right guys eventually. So Tracy, if I, 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 I'm not an expert, but I, you're probably competing with bigger, traditional, older incumbents in some ways than Mob was, right? Do I have that wrong? What, what, what got you sellable? What, what got you really off the ground? Every, beautiful software is great, but we all want to build that, right? What made it, what made it sellable? Sure. Our first 10 users, um, I'm trained as a construction engineer, so the first 10 users were definitely people we had worked with in the field. And it's easy to get our friends to try out our software. It's incredibly difficult to get our friends to start paying for it. So that is a difference. building something that they <laughs> wanted and that they needed that added undeniable value to their day-to-day -day was the moment they started paying us. Was the feedback from your non-paying friends useful? Was it, was it, was it unhelpful? Was it dishelpful? Um, so our first beta group, which included you know, mostly people we had worked with in the field, was about 30 people. 29 of them started paying us as soon as the beta was over. They did pay you. Mm -hmm. Got it. OK. Mm -hmm. So were they, were they bigger critics than outside customers? 
Um, Sometimes it's hard to hard to figure out how to take advantage of friends as early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're really testing my memory. So, um, <laughs> um, no, it was it was at that point in 2011, 2012. It's about I want this to do more for us. Can you build the X Y Z? Got it. Mm -hmm. And what was obviously the product was future poor at the time, right? What was what was the one piece that was 10x better? Uh, so blueprints are at the core. Plan Grid replaces physical blueprints. You know, fold out maps. We don't have them anymore. Actually, with this group, you guys probably have never purchased a fold out map before. Uh, but we use Waze. We use Apple Maps. We use Google Maps. And with blueprints, it's the same analogy. These massive, incredibly dense um, pieces of paper with information, and they just don't render quickly on PDF viewers. So um, it was just. So what was the fest. one line, what was the pitch to make your beautiful product sellable? Was it I'm really glad. I was faster? hoping you'd ask me what the tagline was. What was the tagline? Our tagline, and this is from <laughs> my co-founder, Kenny, our yeah. tagline was Plan Grid, eliminates the bullshit, uh, except that marketing has now changed it. Um, so we're the, we're the productivity software for construction. Got it. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll dig in more on that. Um, so boy, which which part? Where do we want to answer this question? So we start we start hosting applications, right, for others. Yeah. What's the early history? What didn't tell us? What didn't work, or at least didn't scale, and that what did work? In sure. Terms of a sellable product. So so the background here is so nine years in, we started out as a company called Dot Cloud, and now we're a different company called Docker. But there is a common thread, right? It's the same company, it's the same team with the same mission, but we changed how we do it. In the first phase as Dot Clouds. We, um, well, let, let me start with what the common thread is. The common thread is we help developers be more productive. We give them tools to create applications. And uh, then we help the businesses behind those developers um, solve their business problems with the creation of software. And we're surfing on this trend of more people um, creating software to do more things. So uh, the first phase, we did that by uh, hosting the applications. So we said, just write the code, upload it to us, we'll take care of everything, we'll run it for you, we'll manage it for you, all of it. And, um, and then now as Docker, we don't do the hosting. We provide the tools, uh, you use the tools yourself, and then uh, you host the application. And ev eventually, as a business, you need uh, help with various aspects of uh, distributing your software um, at large scale. Yes. So th in the first phase, we we're very small. We didn't have any sort of hype behind us. We were just trying to convince developers to use our stuff. And, um, and we used, honestly, we used our own community. We're programmers. We, we write software. And we know a lot of other programmers. And we just annoyed the hell out of all of them to use our stuff. We gave it to them for free. And then kind of through, through the individual programmers, eventually made our way to the business behind the programmer. So the difference, I think, is that um, for us, it's a two-step process where f the, our, our users and our biggest advocates are not the people paying for the, for the product. Uh, so, so that means we have to give a lot of stuff away for free before we even get the first conversation with the actual buyer. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you, so those first early years, uh, it's not even the same product you have today remotely, right? How did you survive? Uh, did, you, did you raise 50 million in your seed round? Or no. How, how, did you, how did you pull this off, right? No, so. Surviving's a hard part, right? Well, so when you're a very small team, uh, you know, you, you, you have kind of a limited window of time where you can survive and not a lot. Yeah. Um, it's hard usually for that to last much more than 24 months, isn't it? That's right, but yeah, yeah so. Uh, we joined uh, Y Combinator in 2010 and, uh, you know, raised our first small round of funding um, at the end of 2010, so within six months. And we got just it. got went at it gradually. Um, I mean, it's nothing, nothing particularly uh, unique there. But you got into YC about 24 months after founding? That was... Yeah, so the first part was really tough. It was bootstrapped. We did consulting. Uh, we did whatever. Consulting we, was the hack. Right? Whatever it was the hack. Whatever we had to do to pay the bills, uh, it was really tough. My my advice would be, consulting and um, product building, are they're very useful, but uh, you got to get out of it really quickly because it just the consulting takes all of your time. You will never get off the ground as a product company. It there's too much distraction in consulting. So eventually, we just took a leap of faith. Yes. Um, and landed in our feet in Y Combinator. So got it. And then one last question, and then I, I want to move on to the next topic. But 
So what is now Docker has gone through two and a half evolutions of the business model, right? And you've made open source work for you, right? What's the, what's the secret there? What's the learning? Because uh, we think it's hard to monetize open source. Yeah, so honestly, I don't know how useful my insights are here because really the trick is to get really lucky. <laughs> and you know the, the, um, the situation we're in now is that the, the open source technology that we developed, Docker, is extremely popular. It, yes. you know, we were in the right place at the right time. There's this whole trend around containers, which we kind of helped start. And now just the demand for it is honestly hard to describe. So uh, you, you start having a completely different set of problems once you're in that situation. So honestly, the problems we had before that moment in 2013 when we launched the open source Docker and after are worlds apart. Yeah. Now, honestly, it's more uh, how do we deliver on the incredible demand fast enough before competitors do it instead. So there, there is no outbound in iCase. It, the question is too much inbound, which seems like a nice thing, but it's actually- It's noise. It's, it's noise and it's also, you drop a lot of it on the floor. Yeah. Uh, and, and your competitors pick it up. Yeah. Um, so Tracy, let's come back to, I wanna come back to your fun story. You, 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 you hit up 30 of your friends from construction and 29 became customers. Um, as you scale, uh, how, what do you do with customer feedback? How, how important is this? How much do you listen to? How much of it is noise? Uh, how much do you let it guide your roadmap? What have you learned? I don't know how you build product without listening to your customer's feedback. We certainly take it incredibly seriously. We've, we've logged and categorized every single piece of feedback that our clients have given us since 2011. Um, it's incredibly easy. We've made that process. You just come on planger.com and you're like, I want to give you feedback and then our support team will take it. They'll ship it over to the product team. We'll look at it every quarter and it does help us prioritize. Um, the, the big task here is making sure that we're prioritizing the right stuff because sometimes our users will ask us, you know, can Planger make my breakfast and dinner? Yes. And so, you know, when, when there's large general contractors and smaller subcontractors and building owners, asking us for the same button and telling us that if you just have this thing, it's gonna save me so much time. And there's enough domain experience on the team, like when so many customers are asking for the same thing, it's probably the right thing to build, although tracking is obviously important. But we, we typically look at it as like, how hard is this to build? How much resources do we have to put into this? Versus how much value and impact is it gonna give our users? And if it's like low level of effort and high impact, we're gonna prioritize that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, that's really helped us guide our, our product roadmap. And have you, have you had any of your bigger customers drag your roadmap in a different way than your smaller customers? Um, yes, the, the larger customers, um, you know, they, they wanna be treated like princess, princess and princesses, that yeah. they're you know, running our entire business, um, but they're incredibly supportive of us. Um, it's it's nice that not one any single one customer has that big of a percentage of our revenue, and so um, we you know they just want to make sure that we're listening to them and that we're showing them what the future of PlanGrid looks like yeah. and that we're constantly improving it because they're not only buying PlanGrid today but they're buying buying PlanGrid six months from now. It's a, it's a commitment, right? It's a relationship. It's a long term commitment, mm -hmm. right? And so and how many customers total do you have at PlanGrid? Tens of, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. But the revenue distribution, it's probably several orders of magnitude at your biggest customers, right? Mm -hmm. when, even if it's a couple percent of revenue, or maybe in the early days, when they ask you to build something that's kind of on your roadmap, that's way out there, because this is an issue we all face, do you build it? Um, you know, the, the B2C guys always say no, right? But when your big customer wants you to build a 2019 feature, do you build it? Again, if there's like a ton of the big customers asking us for the same thing, it's, yeah. it's easy to prioritize that. But we have never built a feature out for just one customer. That doesn't make sense. We're building software for the construction industry, not XYZ construction. Got it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Harry Lobb, is, is there a difference between the different size customers? Uh, definitely a big on difference product, between our yep. large and small customers. Um, we spend a lot of time focusing on, on like the larger customers, right? I think one thing you mentioned earlier, Right? Uh, do our do our large customers impact our roadmap? They certainly do, 
right? That said, I think it's also about being transparent in the conversation from the first deal. Like, what are you building? You're not just selling one particular feature, one particular item. It's a roadmap, right? It's like you're investing in lob. You're going to be building infrastructure on it. Like, we need to talk to that roadmap. And when larger customers are purchasing, they're looking at what are we building, you know, six months from now trying to understand what that is. And for us, it's about finding a balance between like the type of customers that we want uh, and listening to those customers a little bit more that are more strategic. So for us, we're selling something that's very ubiquitous, right? Mail comes in many shapes, formats, sizes, and there's literally endless amounts of combinations that we could do. Uh, and if we entertained every single request, we did end up going a million directions um, all the time. So for us, um, we focus very strategically on operational mail. So mail that customers are compliant and required to send as opposed to marketing mail, right? Like, that's not to say we don't do a lot of marketing mail. We still do. Um, but when we think about roadmap conversations and it comes to a trade-off between A or B, we're always going to look at the customer who, one, we have a relationship with, right? Two is the direction that we want the company to move to begin with. And that's how we prioritize that. And sometimes that means saying no to customers. And oftentimes we found they're okay with that so long as you're transparent about what you're trying to do. Yeah. So Solomon, let's talk, you, you, you said in the beginning you guys were five, five co-founders for two years, right? I think, uh, that no, roughly? That, um, Do I have that wrong? No, I think I heard five co-founders. Oh, is it Tracy, five? Yeah. We'll get into equity splits later. Okay. At, at minute 51 did I learn how to that, but uh, okay. Uh, but anyhow, related question. So, but I want to, I want to ask the, the, uh, most of the panel this. Um, as you scale, let's talk about, because this is always a great learning, a, a mishire, right? So as you get out of your core team, is there a, core functional area or VP or someone that you thought you needed or got wrong in the early days? Um, anything you can learn from? What's the biggest hiring mistake you made? Uh, I don't know about the biggest, but we made a lot. Like visceral? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we made a lot. Uh, I think everyone, I, I don't know anyone who hasn't. Everyone, made, uh, yes. But we yeah. can learn from this to the next yeah, generation, we can. right? I, Make I, this, I, this mistake a little, I, little fewer times. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, the biggest challenge is once you grow into full-fledged um, company, then you grow outside of your zone of comfort. If you're of comfort, if you're a technical, if you're on the technical and product side, then you have to hire not you know business people. Yeah. If you're on the business side, you have to hire more uh, technical and product leadership. And you know it's things that at some point you don't know, and you don't know what you don't know. And I remember as an engineer, hiring non-engineers, it was very difficult for me because uh, I knew I needed help, but I didn't have the know-how to distinguish the different kinds of non-engineers that I needed. It seems really silly to say that, but to me, you know, marketing was just the, th you know, marketing and sales, it was like the, the, the not coding thing. And um, also, uh, I, I moved to the US from France. Yes. And uh, Americans are extremely good at selling themselves. You know, I hear that a lot from European founders. <laughs> I hear that as a consistent and thing. So right here. you arrive yeah. here and you, you meet 10 people who are like, wow, these are all rock stars. Worked at Plan Grid and, and Box, resumes. and you just yeah. want to hire them right then and there. Yeah, and you? and you yeah. do. And then you realize, okay, there's more to this. And the biggest problem is you're, you're, when you hire the wrong person, yeah. you're, you're, the state of mind is, oh, it's, it's a bad person. You know, they're, they're bad and, and my company's good. And now I hired the bad person. But really, what's happening is, it, everyone's wasting their time. It's the it's 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 not the right combination of people, and you're going to find out six months later, and it's going to be a, a terrible nuisance. So, um, I, I I don't really know if I've learned anything how to avoid it, but uh, every time we've made a mistake, we've tried to really invest the time to go back and find out why what we did wrong, so that we don't make the same mistake twice. Honestly, yeah, um, and. Um, I it's guess, a good it gets, insight. It's the higher. It's not the yeah. higher's fault. It's your fault, isn't it? Y yeah. Ex I, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. And and my feeling is it's the hardest at the beginning, uh, but if you find once you have a core group of people, like five key people in areas that you don't really understand and master, but you build a relationship of trust with those people, yeah, then it gets easier because you trust them to hire more people. Uh, the really bad situation is if you don't sort out that stuff early on, like you make a, a hire, you feel like it might be a bad hire, but you don't deal with it right away. You allow it to um, fester. And then before you know it, you're growing and that person has hired 20 more people. And now you're in big trouble because now you got to deal with the mismatch potentially with 20 people. So I would, my, my only advice would be, you're going to make mistakes, just deal with them early and, and listen to your gut. You know, if your gut says, oh, maybe this is the wrong thing, you know, trust yourself, even if it's not your field of expertise. I mean, I'm probably 
repeating uh, common sense here, but. Uh, uh, well, yeah. we all make the same mistake. Tracy, I want to hear your story too, but let me flip it around. You have five co-founders, right? So you've got, you probably had a lot of the, you felt like you had at least two or two of the bases covered in the early days, at least in theory, right? Who were, who, what was a, one of these early hires you made that was extremely impactful, that, that, that moved the needle, that, that, that helped increase the business? Our employee number one. Employee number one, who was that? Because there's just core Lorenz. Um, you know, we're early on, there's nothing, and you have to build something from nothing. The more people that we can get onto the team to help realize our, our mission as a company is incredibly important. And I would say the same about employee number two, employee number three, employee number 300. Yeah. Was there a particular functional area or someone that, that changed things for you? What? They're all great. <laughs> I mean, we, we brought them on because we needed help, right? So it's hard to just pinpoint one person. For sure. Um, well, let me ask a different question. You have five founders. Uh, when, when do you bring on VPs or directors or others to take over the functional areas from them? What did you learn from that experience? Yeah, the, the point when we realized that we, you know, as being a founder, especially doing it for the first time, so much of our jobs is just learning on the spot and trying to get it to work, get it, to get the job done. Um, as we've recruited more and more people to the team, there comes a point where it's like, wow, we have to become really good at managing people. And this yeah. is all new for the founders. Um, I think we got pretty good at it, especially as like just a frontline engineering manager. Um, but there comes to a point where we're at like 50 people, 150 people, and it's like Dunbar's number. It's like complete chaos. Suddenly communication gets so much harder. And I think that's when we started layering in executives who had done it before. Because now we have experience of people who aren't, who aren't like the founders, who aren't learning on the job. They've done it before. They've done it three times before very successfully. And it just like is much easier to run the business that way. Yeah, that's a good insight of when... We all, we all want to hire the folks who've done it before early, right? Not all of us, but we get attracted to the, to, the, to, the, to the box on the resume. But maybe that Dunbar number is the right time to think about it, right? Uh, when, when did you benefit from folks that maybe weren't as fluent in the product, but were fluent in the, process the processes? Yeah, um, if I could do it over, I'd probably bring them on earlier. But at that point, it's just like you're trying to recruit someone who's very, very good at their jobs, who are getting paid tons of money at wherever they're at. And it's hard to recruit them to your, you know, little shit startup. But, <laughs> um, but you know, you sell, you sell your butts off. Um, yeah. Actually, you never stop selling your butts off about your mission, your vision as a company. And so being able to deliver that message of what you're trying to do and also showing the traction, showing the growth. That's, when you see that graph, everyone wants to be a part of it. They did, right. yeah. Did, was there a moment, recruiting is always hard, but was there a, a, a moment when it got easier? Practice, practicing gets easier, so I'd say maybe. But from maybe... a brand perspective, did Plan Grid get to the point? Did, did you know, Sequoia or others or Press or you, or did it get, it's always, I wanna, I wanna ask a related question, but did it get in some way easier when you became a, 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 a more interesting startup to, to, to a broader community? Yeah, so, you know, we're a YC company. We're also in the Sequoia portfolio. Um, we flash that to our advantage. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so good. So, uh, Harry, what? Any any learnings on hiring mistakes or great hire you made? What that, that moved the needle for you? Yeah. Um, so I can actually talk to one you mentioned earlier. Just like realizing that you need to hire good managers. Uh, it's a big moment for us in the past like, couple of years. And that was actually one of the early mistakes we made, which was like one of our best ICs uh, thought he wanted to be a manager. Uh, and we really wanted him to manage the team too. Uh, he hadn't actually had experience doing that before. And when we put the, him in that role, he struggled. Um, and that had some, you know, that put us through like a tough six months, right? And I think we learned the lesson early on. It's like you want people who have already done it once before because even though you may trust somebody and they're awesome at what they do, there's it's hard to discount the value of experience, right? And that's something like just having seen it before, the type of problems you can see, um, that's made a big difference. So for us, like I'd say, like you know, our first most huge hire is like we had somebody in our head of engineering role that didn't pan out, and our second head of engineering was just incredible, right? he literally made problems disappear. Like things that we would sit there and worry about. I'd be at dinner with my co-founder talking about like this and this people issue. And then next thing we knew, like literally three weeks after he started, like we just never talked about it, heard about it again. And everyone seemed to be happy and working harder and staying longer. And we didn't really feel like we were doing anything different. You know, we just had somebody different on a role. And you know, and finding that And how quickly person, did you know? 30 days? 14, how quickly did you know it was impactful? Um, probably within- An hour? 
So we had the advantage of already having someone in the role, so we sort of knew what good looked like and what great was. Um, yeah. And uh, obviously, we we're always looking at that. But you know, in the first thirty days, I think you can immediately tell the difference uh, they're having at the team. Um, even within the first, you know, first two weeks, a lot of learning, and you can just tell from the quality of the questions that they're asking. Right? What are they thinking about? How far are they planning ahead? Um, and then really, like, we started to see a lot of changes happen in the second week in terms of like, taking everything they learned throughout the interview process, getting to know the company, and also adopting it to their own style. Right? And I think, uh, first and foremost, like, not just hiring for experience, but hiring for a culture fit um, is really, really important. Um, you know, we had, have had great hires in the past, awesome ICs that we let fester a little too long because of cultural things. And you know, having to rewind that back and you know, a few years later was definitely challenging. Um, so I think, you know, culture fit now, like we spend a ton of time through our interview process. Um, we've changed our, we've updated our values, worked into the interview process. Each person is responsible for asking one particular component of that. Uh, and that's like one of the first things we evaluate, regardless of not whether the person can do the job. It's like, is, he, is this someone we'd work with? And this is someone who's going to fit well and really bring their own individual skill set to the company. Yeah, that's a good point. Tracy, let me, let me uh, go back to a point you made about the journey that your customers are signing up for six and 12 months, and maybe they're even signing up for 60 months and 100 months. Um, especially in the early days, or, you know, products are super feature poor, right? I mean, you had 29 folks sign up immediately, but it's still feature. How do, you, how do you convince them to go on that journey when you have incumbents that are feature rich? What's, what have you learned? There's nothing like adoption in the field. So there's certainly lots of incumbents, some that you know very well. Um, there's also a lot of startups here and that are just, you know, if you have any success at all, your software will be copied. You guys are dealing with that right now. And so just making sure that we are developing products that are actually being used in the field has been key to PlanGrid success. That regardless of what VP of operations or CIOs want to deploy, the software that's being used on construction site, yes. like for real, is is our software because super we we made sure we were building software for the superintendents and foremen and carpenters and electricians in a way that is actually powerful to them that actually helps them do their jobs better. So you're you, a lot of your history. So, so this is learning for me, but a lot of your history is coming in from the field, even if the. The CIO's office, whoever it is. Maybe. We build software for them too. So, you know, we've got <laughs> admin panels. Um, we have SSO coming out for them. Yes. We've got, you know, beautiful graphs and stuff because they are, they are a decision maker and that's important to us. But I think early days, I mean, first four years of PlanGrid, yes. we were definitely not prioritizing products for, for the people in the office. And would you, would, what, and how, and, and let's just talk about that for a minute because that's always interesting, right? And so, you get in through the field, they love your product, they can adopt it immediately instead of taking six months. Um, and how, do you, how did you deal with that conflict if, this, if uh, a, lar a different vendor had already been selected by procurement or any learnings on how to, yeah. how to deal with that? Um, our industry is super interesting because we, we essentially sell to construction projects. There's certainly construction companies that manage like several projects at the time, but the beauty of our industry, and it's also, it's like both the best and worst thing is when we're in a construction project, there's actually 50 different customers for us to sell to. There are the carpenters, there's electricians, there's the concrete folks, the pool installers, the paint yeah. person. Um, and so there's this natural virality that happens within construction projects. A foreman starts using PlanGrid and it's a cultural thing too. As a construction person, you just want to show off your shiny new tool. And PlanGrid's so cool that you sort of want to be the first one to show everyone else on the project. And so we were always laser focused at building something that was easy to adopt, easy to use, and um, that would sort of spark that network effect within construction projects. So here's corporate standardizing on a software, then you've got the field, which the, the person really paying for it is the building owner. Yeah. And so we've just been laser focused at getting our software adopted. Um, at the ground level, which is very different than any other software in this space. And you and you spend a lot of time on those other users that actually don't write the, that don't pay for Plan Grid. All the other folks in the project. How do you make them happy too? Yeah, we we made sure to build something that was flexible enough that would that could be used by anyone in the architectural, engineering, and construction industry. Um, prioritizing product is, is a key factor here. Yeah. We didn't want to build something that was just for one profile. We wanted it to be flexible, flexible enough that it could be used by everyone in the industry. Yeah. 
So, so Solomon, let's talk a, a variant of this sort of competition and long journey for you. I, I, um, I feel like Docker is a, a, a product and a vendor that people are rooting for. Uh, I think there are a lot of the Docker fans, I would say. How do you, how do you, how do you invest in that? How do you, how do you return that social contract on the product side, especially as competition increases, right? As you prove yourself, everyone wants to do something in the broad container market. Competition's everywhere. How do you, how do you keep that like 100 MPS that Docker probably has? Yeah. Um, so do you uh, measure MPS? We measure, well, <laughs> we measure MPS. Happiness? Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, the, the problem for us is who do we ask? Because there's a lot of different audiences. A lot of audiences. Actually, it's really interesting comparison. That I think the same thing is happening in a lot of industries. There's a sort of a bottom-up go-to-market, right, where first you get the practitioners on board, and then you get their bosses on board, maybe yeah. later. Maybe, um, you know, maybe they learn about your product only once dozens or hundreds of people in their organization are using it. Even today at Docker. So it's this, it, yeah. So we use that. a rogue we, app in some. We use that heavily, companies? yes, yeah. yeah. And, and so today, as a business, we target uh, enterprises, very large businesses. That is our focus. We sell also to small businesses. We, we're kind of in a similar situation. You got the tens of thousands, and then the majority of the revenue comes from a few hundred. Um, but all of them uh, are in this uh, relationship with us as a vendor because someone on their team at some point said, new app, awesome, Docker, I went to Meetup, sounds great. Or yeah. I saw I saw a discussion online about it. So we owe everything to that, to that community. And uh, there's a lot of positive vibes in that community. Honestly, it's pretty insane if you've ever been to a Docker Meetup or- We, were we had Docker Con. Con. That was it's like 5,000 people, it's right? Just, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, and, so how do you, in the early days, how do you facilitate that? What are the learnings? How do you get that flywheel going? You know, it, it's honestly, we, we started something very small and the day 10 people, sh we showed it to a few people, one by one, and then um, 10 of them came back to our office saying, hey, we want to know more. And it was just the most fun three hours of my life. Basically, we were just talking about all the cool stuff we could build with Docker, and then they came back the week after that, and it was 40 people, and then it was 100. So pretty, pretty. that, that was the first week of the existence of Docker, right? Yeah. Uh, and so right away, we, we saw, okay, there's something special going on here, and there's a community forming, and they're basically saying, hey, you, the company you started this, um, you're you're the janitor now. Like, make sure you know uh, organize things for us because this is our thing now. Uh, and so we just took that job really seriously of enabling that community to do whatever it decides to do. So we've been following that community ever since, and just removing obstacles for that community to grow, do more things together. And so we have a whole team that's focused on that, just enabling the community. We have all these cool programs. We have, I think, 120 meetups in the world. Uh, 100,000 people have. 120 meetups a year. All right. No, so it's 120 locations uh, in the world, each with uh, you know an average of a meetup every two months or so. Got it. And then 100,000 people, I think, overall have showed up at least once to one of these meetups. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a captain's program, which is sort of a like elite, uh, you know, power user, where you know the 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 most savvy and uh, articulate users of Docker, we kind of promote them and, and uh, pay them for them to go and speak at events and they just become these stars in the community. So we, we just, it's a huge investment for us, but it, all, about, all of it is about giving back. Got it. How many of these captains are there out of curiosity? I think now there's uh, maybe 20, 30. It's a small number. Uh, Probably sounds like a lot to some of us. It's, oh, a, lot, yeah, it's a lot of captains. Right, yeah. it's a lot of captains. But yeah. you said you had 400 employees. I mean, they're not employees, but it's a significant amount of your extended family. Right? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah, and so it's, Anyway, the, the, when you see a community, yeah. when you see anyone super excited about what you're doing, just drop everything you're doing and make sure you put themselves as, as your service, at, at their service. Uh, in our case, it's developers using a, a, an open source tool, uh, you know, but it, it looks like there's something similar going on. I'm sure there's, um, I'm gonna say it wrong, but whatever the job is of someone actually working on a construction site, uh, some of them, I'm sure, are just huge fans of the, the tool, and they go everywhere, and they just they tell tell all their buddies about it. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's how consumer products used to grow. I think yes. now it's increasingly in seeing uh, the best B two B products also grow that way. Well, let's make that our last question. So I want to save a few minutes for questions, so we have it. But related to that, and I, I think I already know the answer for Docker. So let's just do uh, Plan Grid and Law. But 
Tracy, today, what percent of your new customers come from word of mouth or brand or uh, what, what this, all this, this great goodwill that you've built across the industry? Yeah, yeah, How does yeah. that pay off today? I mean, we definitely ship Facebook ads and stuff, but most of our new customers comes, from, comes from just word of mouth organic growth. Which is yeah. awesome, but then it's also uncontrollable, right? It just some kind of comes naturally to us, and we don't know what sparks it. But we know that if we make our, our clients happy and we build great product for them, that that does continue to happen year after year. Yeah. Is that happening at Lob yet? Are you getting most of your customers from the base? Yeah. Uh, our base customers are, are the folks that are referring uh, a good portion. So of you're not our, having to send all customers. the emails yourself today anymore? No. Right? I mean, what we've actually <laughs> found, you know, some of what Salma was saying, one of the things that's interesting, we have these folks have been at three different companies in like a four year span and have used Lob at three companies. That's and when they you know bring it's us, working. They yeah, bring they us keep every bringing single you time. In. Right, and it's great because you know every time I get an email from it's like a different company. It's like, hey, I want to bring you here. I was like, great, I I love to chat with you. Yes. Right, and, I, and you want those those folks who are going to be your evangelists, who love your product. Um, everywhere they go, they're going to find a way to use you because they they like it. Right, um, and that's that's really important, and that played a big part for some of our other customers going to different companies, bringing us there, um, and then you also get the referral of like you know especially you what you want to do is you want to create word of mouth, and we found this to be very successful at conferences. Right, where we already have a good uh, foundational layer of companies. So for us, like FinTech and the lending space is a big one. Right, So we're going out, we're at LendIt, and our customers will bring their friends over to our booth. But, oh, yeah, these guys are great. Right, And there's nothing like a, a positive referral from someone who's an existing customer to somebody else that's doing something very similar. Um, and that uh, is part of the reason why we go every single year. And we sit there, we smile, we host a customer appreciation event, um, and eventually we love to get to the point where we could do like a, a lob con, you know, get a bunch of folks together. <laughs> you, may, you may be ready already, actually. I think, <laughs> I think, right? You may be ready. All right, we keep going on this, but let's take some questions. Anyone got any great questions for the panel? <coughs> hey, I was wondering, like, what was your past, what was like one past experience that you think helped you the most while starting your own company? <coughs> Jason, can you repeat the questions? I can. Uh, the question was, what was one, oh, you're right, I, keep, I'm, I like redundancy, <laughs> I worry, um, I like five nines of uptime. Um, what was one experience uh, prior to starting your company that actually helped you get it off the ground? So two of the five co-founders of PlanGrid had built buildings before, and the other three were building software. Um, just our ability to, like, rally resources and people and, and build something together the ability to work together really helped us work in a startup together. It just feels like the medium's changed. For me, instead of concrete and brick, it's, it's people, people and code and more people. Do you think you could penetrate the industry with no domain expertise? I mean, I'm sure it's been done, but what, what's your learning on domain expertise? Um, I think it's possible. Uh, you just have to become an expert fast. So somehow you have to compensate <laughs> for it. I can comment on that one a little bit. You know, I, I didn't have any domain expertise in mail. Uh, I don't think a ton of people have domain expertise in mail. <laughs> I am an expert now, though, and um, certainly that's something I've learned. Uh, but for me, past experience, right, uh, I spent, when I came out of college, I went, I went to Microsoft. And this is like the last place in the world you'd expect to send mail and have it be effective. Um, one of the projects I worked on there, uh, we, for multiple different privacy reasons, like we're not allowed to email, we couldn't do it through the channel uh, for another couple reasons, and like my only option was either calling everybody, which didn't seem very you know feasible at the time, uh, or sending people all these nice little kits. And turns out like the best performing thing was mail, and I ended up spending three months and like hundreds of thousand dollars, huge budgets, like working on this and realizing that this is something like people actually do, and companies like Microsoft do every day, and it works, um, but it's really hard and it's ancient, like. We had people suggesting us like automation, paying tens of thousands of dollars for implementation to get like an FTP folder that we like drop an Excel file into. And it seems sort of ridiculous, but that was part of the inspiration for how we started working on Lob. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts about big companies who can offer a competing service or product that can leverage their operations expertise, a company like Amazon, for example? Yeah, or let's let's how, how how do you deal with big companies that can do it all, right? How do you deal with that situation? Yeah. <laughs> I think there's probably there's a generic answer that's true for every business, and then there is for every startup, and then there's maybe some uh, domain specific answers. Um, I think 
the, the, personally, I think something that's true for all startups is that you have focus and you have speed. And per, I had never worked at a large company before, so I did not appreciate exactly the advantage uh, we have as a smaller company. But n <laughs> now that we're growing a little bit, I can already tell what happens when you grow. <laughs> and so the goal really is to take advantage of our small size while we're small, faster than we accumulate problems as we grow. When, when, you're, when you're big and you have a successful business, everyone working there, you, the majority of people working there, first of all, were not there at the time when the business became successful. So they all, it's long forgotten how they became successful in the first place. They're administrating an existing cash cow and so it's a completely different kind of people, generally speaking, right? Except maybe at the very top. You got a few VPs that are, you know, the original guy who did it and then he's running something. But usually these are people who, um, at, a lar at your average large company, they're, they're not united as one group to make, uh, to make that, that company succeed against um, outside threats like you. Um, they are uh, focused usually on their career, are they going to get promoted? Are they going to get more people under them? You know, it, the, it's, it's inside facing rather than outside facing. And most large companies are like that. And that's, uh, that's an advantage because they're not looking for threats. Uh, the other advantage is focus. Large companies tend to be doing a lot of things. And uh, when you're competing with a company that has 10,000 people and you have 10, it might seem really daunting. but the particular part of that company that is actually competing with you, for all you know, might also be 10 people. And they might be underfunded, they might be on the wrong side of the big boss who just doesn't care about the product. And over time, as you start competing, you'll find out which ones are serious threats uh, and which ones are basically to be ignored. So, it's hard to tell from the outside. Hard to tell, but as, as you start getting a, becoming an expert and you yeah. talk to customers, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Customers are going to say, well, I'm thinking about you and these other two, three things. And uh, some names are going to come up a lot. And uh, some of them will be other startups. Some of them will be other big companies. And then you narrow down your focus and you figure out, okay, what makes that big company smarter than the others? Um, but it's, you can break down the problem, basically. Go ahead. What do you think are the biggest factors that lead customers to tell other customers about your product? That's the, that's the magic question. What do you think the biggest factors are that create this word of mouth, that get other customers to, to refer you out? What, what can you point to specifically? I mean, the short answer is good product. Um, something <laughs> something that, that saves them time. At the end of the day, that's all, that's all we care about. We've got this one precious thing that we don't get more of, and because PlanGrid absolutely saves our users time, it's why they've told everyone else. But let's, let me just, and Tara, let me ask you a variant of that question. So you had the great story of the customer that left, the, the, the 3X, the yep. 3X, that's a great story. But in B2B, it's hard for that to happen in three weeks, right? Yeah. How, many, how long did that take to get that, those three customers out of that first great experience? Yeah, I, mean, I think the first thing you realize is customers aren't going to just all of a sudden start referring them to you, they want to build a relationship and trust you. And the only reason why that happened is because the first year, it went from this, this particular individual, like started off as a very, very small, like couple thousand dollar a month customer and grew to be like a 50, $60,000 a month customer, very, very large in a short period of time. And we did a lot, like in a lot of things, we were very transparent that like, hey, we, we can't get this done in this time frame. here's what we can do. Um, you know, I had a cell phone number. We frequently text when things go wrong. And for us, I think the biggest reason why he actually went and referred us is because of how we handled things when things didn't go the way we planned, mm -hmm. right? Everybody wants projects to go perfectly, launch on time. Like, and the reality is it doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes there's factors out of your control. Um, but I think the way that we handle ourselves when things didn't go planned um, was a huge vote in confidence that like this is a company that we can trust because like, we're watching people scramble. And I remember like, there's one instance uh, around Christmas, like some deliveries didn't happen for key customers. We went out and like drove out and just like delivered it. Cause I was like, oh, the guy's like down the street. It's not a big deal. We'll just go get it done. And he was hugely appreciative. And it was a small thing, right? And it was a very small campaign that he was doing. But a story like that, that he clings on to when he goes to a new, you know, uh, a new company and so like, the reason why I work with these guys because they did all this for us, right? And when things were not going well, they still stepped up and you know did the right thing, and and that's why they love us today. But I think it starts with having a good product, right? Mm -hmm. Like if your product's not good, no matter what you do for the customer, he's probably not going to take you because then he's putting his job at risk. Yeah. We should wrap it up there. <laughs>
Wrap it up there. All right, let's thank the panel. This was great. Thank you, everybody.